Happy Monday, friends. I'm Claudia Bellafato alongside my co-host and friend, Joe Fan. This is episode 12 of Bet to Win. We have another packed show. I'm very excited. Joe, you're looking very green today. I look beautiful. I look super sound. In honor, <laughs> I look beautiful. Just saying, in honor of the NBA season, RIP Seattle Supersonics, they will come back. They will return at some point. So okay. this begins another season for me where I get to root against the Thunder. <laughs> And that's just how I that's how I live my life as an NBA fan these days. Okay, I so, respect it. As I, I am a fan of whoever is playing the Thunder. If the Thunder make the playoffs, I, I, I cheer for whoever they're playing till they lose. And uh, and that's just how I go about the NBA. So I love hoops. <laughs> I, I've played basketball my whole life. Yeah. Grew up a diehard Sonics fan. It was one of the darkest moments of my probably the darkest moment of my sport my sports fandom. Mm-hmm. Um, but still got to rep it. So. So you're kind of like Rob Lowe with the NFL hat. You're like any I other think, team. I don't think it's. I don't think that's anywhere near not, what not I am. Not to the extent. Well, you just said you close. basically are cheering for every yeah, other team. Yeah, but I will wear those teams' hats on those games. I, okay. It's okay. like all right. You like, get involved in. I just stuff. hate the Thunder. Okay. With I the it. passion of a thousand suns. Okay. Whatever that means. I don't know. The <laughs> suns have passions. The fire. The fire of a Bo- thousand suns. Bottom line. Bottom line. <laughs> Thunder. <laughs> Bottom out. line, Joe has new swag that shout, he's shout showing. Out to the glove. That he's showing off. I had to now. rock it. I had to rock it. Basketball already kicks off tomorrow, which is crazy. We have, I mean, these shows are go. We keep saying the show's packed, but it's going to be packed because now we have hockey, we have NFL, we have college football, NBA starting. It's about to get crazy up in here. Where are the Celtics in your sports team's hierarchy? Um, like as a Boston fan, the Celtics are. Like I'm still high on the Patriots. I think we have a, a lot to improve on, but still, I'm high on them. I don't I'm mean high, like in terms I'm high of what on the Bruins. Think. I'm saying which teams do you care about most? That's what I'm telling you right now. Oh, okay. Like I love basketball. I also played basketball my whole life. Like yeah. I would still show you up on the court if we were to play tomorrow. <laughs> Even though you guys keep talking about playing, and I haven't gotten a text yet. So if you do play without me, I'm gonna be pissed. Uh, we are gonna get into NBA a little bit because we have a promo later on. But first, we gotta talk football because this was a very interesting weekend for the book. And instead of us just talking about it, interesting is a nice <laughs> way to put it. Instead of us just talking about it, as we do every Monday now, we have senior trader this time, Grant Tucker. Grant, thanks for coming back on. We had you on a few weeks ago. Grant, how do you feel about the word interesting? <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a good way to put it. Um, I would call it a bloodbath. I think bloodbath's more fitting. <laughs> yep, yep. And we always talk ebbs and flows. Uh, this week, not so great for the book. We'll go over the three main games that weren't so great, starting with the Cowboys. Patriots. So Cowboys winning cover. They were laying three and a half here. Uh, it was an overtime win. It was a lot of back and forth like we predicted, right? We didn't really expect this to be a blowout win. I did. You did? Yeah. Oh. Okay. I was all in on the Cowboys. I couldn't believe this. Oh, line see, was I thought you took Patriots. Okay. No. Okay. All right. Absolutely not. So so I thought, at least I thought it was going to be yeah. a little, and, and the three and a half kind of shows too. We weren't expecting it to be a blowout. Uh, Cowboys now six and a half against the spread, uh, six and zero oh <laughs> against the spread. Um, if you had the Patriots spread here, though, for the majority of the game, you felt pretty good. I didn't touch sides here, but for the ma- majority of the game, it's not like the Patriots didn't have handle of this game. Uh, a Patriots touchdown would have been lovely down the stretch. A Patriots field goal would have been great. But the worst case scenario happened. Uh, Cowboys got a stop, scored a touchdown. Huge game from Dak. Four hundred forty-five passing yards, three touchdowns. So, like I mentioned, if you had a Patriots ticket, you weren't really freaking out for the majority of the game, but down the stretch, it didn't look great. The books on 97% of the handle on the Cowboys heading into this game. What did this book, what did this look like in terms of the book? Yeah, so uh, we actually really liked this spot for the Patriots. Uh, We thought, you know, the Cowboys headed to the East Coast. We thought, you know, the Patriots would at least get inside that number. And, you know, so we were kind of willing to take Cowboys money all week. And, I mean, the public got the the last laugh, as you said. Mm. Uh, A couple, you know, questionable play calls there at the end of the game. I really thought, you know, Bill would just, you know, pound the run down the stretch, kind of turn some clock, pass across the middle. Next thing you know, you you got a change there. This is an interesting game because I I was shocked that, and this is why I'm such, I mean, I am very much the public because I saw this line and was like, what am I missing here? Mm. Because the Cowboys are a far superior team. Yes, they're going on the road, but it's the afternoon slot. It's not even a West Coast team. And you look at the way the game played out, 567 total yards to 335. 
look at the missed opportunities with Dak fumbling at the goal line, where I think he got in on third down. They had another they had a couple turnovers in the red zone, missed field goals, busted coverages in the secondary, big penalty. They, the Cowboys dominated this game. The Cowboys should have covered comfortably. So it ends up being heartbreak for the book and Patriots betters because especially after uh, after the the Cowboys didn't get the ball to start overtime, then you get a stop. And how often do you see a team uh, then go down and score a touchdown? You usually have this drive, they put it together, and then once you get inside field goal range, you start to get more conservative, kick a field goal, and that's, I think, what everyone expected. CeeDee Lamb gets wide open on the deep crossing route, touchdown, ball game. It's a miraculous cover because it's not just that result, but you look back into regulation where uh, after the pick six, Cowboys are covering. And then the, the Kendrick Bourne 75 yard touchdown, and it comes down to a two point conversion where Cowboys betters all game long are rooting for the Cowboys, obviously, to cover three and a half. But the second that touchdown scored, they're begging for that two point conversion because if they don't get it, they lose, and that's it. And that's the only reason why they still had a chance. And so it's, it's wild when you watch this game, not necessarily as a fan of either team, but from the book side, from a betting side, and how quickly you're saying, okay, Diggs gets that, that pick six. And the Cowboys are locked in. You're going to get a stop. Kiss can't give up a touchdown. Then when they give up the touchdown, you're you're looking at that. This all comes down to this two point conversion. Um, and so I, I guess from a book standpoint, I, I want to ask you of how do you guys ride that wave, where you go from feeling pretty settled, maybe even a little bit lucky to be in the game the way that you were, because like I said, uh, you look at this game, Dallas dominated, but but the Patriots had it cover for pretty much the entire way. Yeah, no, I mean, I think this game right here just sums up the NFL in a nutshell. I mean, it was a roller coaster. Like, that fourth quarter, I mean, you go from we're good here, mm -hmm. we're not good, we're crushed. Somehow we get to overtime, and then at the end of the day, it's just a disaster. Where were you when, you, when you're – Oh, I was all Cowboys. Well, well my thing was we, – I was literally watching Good Morning Football, and I'm, like, so glad I got the Cowboys over nine and a half wins. Feeling pretty good about that. Because I, I always mentioned we were worried about the defense. The defense isn't really that much of an issue. They're giving a lot, up a lot of passing yards, but still, they have Parsons. They have Diggs. The offense, they have the run game. They have the pass game. They have Dak. And basically, this person just went off. Like, they're so overblown. They haven't played big enough competition. I'm like, week one, they almost beat the Bucs. Like, and you're telling me if the Bucs are the best team in football right now. I don't know. I, I guess it's not that much of a conversation if you guys agree. I just are you in on the sure Cowboys? Was, I mean, are you a believer? They're 6-0 and against the spread. I mean, I might Thank just start you. betting them and just retire. I mean, so yeah, so I, I, I guess this is a good question. We've talked about the respect that the Cardinals are going to get. Are the Cowboys maybe going to see a little more respect now after going 6-0 and against the spread? I mean, at, at a certain point, you have to just say, you know, betters are going to come to the window and lay the points regardless of what it is at this yeah. point. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. I just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page. I, I feel better now. Uh, I mentioned the Cardinals. They won and covered again, uh, getting three points against the Browns. It was weird to see them as a dog here, especially for me, because I've been hot on this team. So I was definitely on the Cardinals. This was a good win. Uh, they were mainly only unbeaten team. Kyler Murray had a four touchdown day, no turnovers. You talk MVP. He's definitely a candidate. Browns really had no answer, especially in the second half. Uh, Cardinals ran a 14-0 shutout to secure the win. With the Cardinals getting the points here, you saw almost 67% of the handle on the Browns spread. Explain why this was still a loss for you guys. Well, I mean, uh, like they touched on last episode, uh, last week, um, we're in Arizona now. So every parlay, every teaser, it's all mm -hmm. tied into the Cardinals. So anytime, you know, you see a blowout like this in Arizona's favor, it's going to be uh, it's gonna be a pretty ugly number. We talked about diverse op offenses. I mean, this is, this is just as the same level as the Cowboys. Last year, you saw their passing game was pretty much the DeAndre Hopkins show. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was force feeding him ten plus targets a game, and that when that works, that's beautiful. But when you play a defense that's able to game plan and take some of that away, and, and you're so one dimensional, it's tough to do. AJ Green is still producing at the same level of DeAndre Hopkins. Christian Kirk is still producing. You got Zach Ertz on the way after losing. Uh, Max Williams to injury. James Conner has been productive. Chase Edmonds continues to be one of the most efficient running backs on a per-touch basis in all of football. Oh, and they play defense. They won this game without their head coach. Let me rephrase. They dominated this game on the road without their head, their head coach, yeah. uh, who had COVID, uh, without Chandler Jones, who was out. J.J. Watt has been 
an incredible sign. Finally got his first uh, sack yesterday um, on Sunday. But but this is a guy who has been disruptive throughout. He dominated the Niners the week prior. He's getting pressures and disruptions, uh, impacting quarterbacks on a near play-to-play basis. I really like this team, and, and they continue to show me 6-0. and they, they smoked the Titans, the Rams, and now the Browns all on the road. Mm-hmm. Three playoff teams from a year ago. That's really impressive. I think the Browns are in a really tough spot because the injuries are piling up. Kareem Hunt got hurt. They were already without Nick Chubb. Odell Beckham got banged up again. They're already without Jarvis Landry. Baker Mayfield's got a partially torn labor in that left shoulder. He could be re-injured again on Sunday. And they're as they're looking of what they're going to do with Baker, they're in this situation where I, I call it like Andy Dalton syndrome, where you have like it's you could do so much worse. But you also look in the other sideline, Kyler Murray's over there, and see how much better you can do. And he still has a ceiling, too. And like how, and how, I exactly. think there's so much more we could see from Murray, yeah. And how often is Baker Mayfield the reason why you're winning games? I think he's a good quarterback. But it's hard for, for teams to win Super Bowls with good quarterbacks because, you, again, you can't bank on elite defense to show up every single week, especially with how good these offenses mm-hmm. are. Yep. You can't count on running backs to stay healthy, as we've now seen in Cleveland. So – they're at three and three. I still think they're going to end up being a wild card team. I still believe how talented they are. A couple of good teams they've played back to back with the Chargers and the Cardinals, but they are in a tough, a tough spot, not just now, but, but moving forward with particularly how they decide, you know, to handle Baker Mayfield. The Cardinals, on the other hand, they have the Texans next. So, I mean, they're just. Yeah, what's that number? They're just steamroll. Yeah, what's the look ahead out. there? Uh, that's a good question. It's definitely, it's got to be double digits. I 17. I was going to say, yeah. it has to be. And I'm hammering it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Whatever it is, <laughs> I'm so hot on this team. I remember when it's a text. I mean, when you get beat 31 to three by the Colts, I mean, yeah, is that line going to push 20? I haven't even looked at the early lines. I haven't looked ahead enough. I but mean, just off the top of my head, I mean, I would guess it's like somewhere around 17 or something like that. Yeah, and you probably lean to take that. Yeah, I mean, I remember when like, Houston won Week One, we were like, oh shoot, all of our under. Right, and we were like, season, maybe. Right? maybe I think I think I had them under. Four. Like four and a half. Four, yeah, it was, it was, what it was. Four, four it's, it's looking like 17. 17. 17. Give me that. Ooh. I'll take that 17. I'll take Are you going to? That's going to be fun. I'll Probably. put it in a teaser, but yeah, still. Uh, okay. Raiders, Broncos, last one will break down. Raiders were getting three. They were on the road. They get the win, sort of defying the odds here, right? Because we talked about with Matt how drama outside of the game has an effect. So with the whole Urban Meyer situation, this was a little bit different, but still, he mentioned. With John Gruden resignation, new interim head coach, we were sort of all fading. The Raiders had a little more faith in the Broncos. Well, <laughs> the Raiders really had no issues against a very dull Broncos secondary and D line. On the other side, Raiders defense came through: three interceptions, five sacks. Derek Carr threw for 341 yards, two touchdowns, and the offense actually, even with an interim head coach looked a little more dynamic, a little more unpredictable than we've seen so far this season. This was their highest scoring game so far this season. Kind of weird when, you know, the two games where we didn't have the regular head coaches, they looked great, maybe even better than they have. So we talked about the respect that the Cardinals are due, I guess we could say. Is it the opposite case with the Broncos now moving forward after seeing how they played in this game? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a big concern when you see Bridgewater. I mean, he's not taking care of the football. And yeah. it's really tough to, you know, win games, especially, you know, AFC West divisional matchup like this. I mean, you're not going to win many games like that. Right. The Broncos are, I think we've now, I think, three games that they haven't really been competitive in. Safe to, to say that for those first three weeks you can try. It's hard to know when, when good teams are, are, are beating bad teams or you yeah. think good teams are beating bad teams, how much to make of it. We talked about that with the Bills going into the Chiefs game. They just rattled off some, some dominant wins, but do you say that's just the competition they played or is that legit? The Broncos took care of three bad teams they played, so I was sort of in on the Broncos that, that you can only play the teams that are on your schedule, and if you – don't you know you do what you're supposed to do and put those teams away decisively, which they did against the Giants, Jags, and Jets to open the season, um, only giving up 26 points throughout those collective games, uh, including a shutout of the Jets, 26 nothing. Well, now they've played three real football teams and they've lost all three, all three pretty decisively. They they made it a one score game with the Steelers, but they got handled in that game all game long. This is a bad look for the Broncos. And again, you talk about having a limited quarterback build up some injuries 
They're missing Jerry Judy badly. Um, but Teddy Bridgewater's his calling card has always been he takes care of the football and he's a game manager. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, when you know the explosives aren't necessarily going to be there and you've got some injuries and the margin of error is small, you can't have those turnovers. And again, you look defensively, and we all thought this Broncos defense is going to be a bit better, but banking on defense is always a tough way mm -hmm. to go, especially when you're betting. Um, and so, yeah, for me, I think this says more about the Broncos than it does the Raiders, but the Raiders do deserve a ton of credit. Derek Carr was lights out in this game. Henry Ruggs had a big game. Um, Kenyon Drake finally got involved there I would say a waste of money free agent signing but he had a big game in this one with two touchdowns one rushing one receiving uh, the Raiders I, I still don't think are, are great but at four and two they're, they're going to be in the thick of, of the wild card hunt potentially the AFC West if, if the Chiefs continue to falter um, but I look more the side of the Broncos and say this sort of feels like a rudderless chip where an offense that doesn't have necessarily a, a true identity um, with a quarterback that isn't the future and then a defensive head coach whose defense is getting torched. Um, <laughs> and I think that's the danger of hiring defensive-minded head coaches. Yeah, well, when we went through this week, Joe and I did something a little different. We ran through the whole slate and just kind of picked sides. And I went with the Broncos here. And when I think Broncos this season, I was just like, okay, defense looks good. Raiders going through all these issues. And like you mentioned, the defense isn't showing up. They don't have the offense in rhythm. I don't have much faith in this Broncos team anymore. What do you, what do you, why, where do you, what's your takeaway from this game? Like, are you saying, like, everyone needs to put some respect back on the Raiders? Because a couple weeks, for the last couple weeks, they have not looked good at all. Maybe you give them a pass for the Bears game because of the Gruden stuff. But Yeah, um, yeah. well, I'm just, I'm happy they played some inspired football. I was kind of thinking they were going to come out, you know, go through the motions. Carr would look a little, you know, a little, a little uh, out of it there. But, you know, they came out, scored a touchdown on their first drive. Mm. That's the first time they've done that in 11 games. The only thing that's changed is Gruden's gone. So I'm just mm. saying, I don't know. <laughs> It looks like uh, they're aspiring on all cylinders. I know Max Crosby had a couple sacks. I think I think they're uh, got to put some respect on their name. I have to say, in the first few minutes, I was like, "Oh crap!" Exactly. <laughs> there was a few of those yeah. games, like the Chargers game. I was like, "Oh, yeah, I picked the it wrong starts, side here." You did, yeah. And that's yeah. how I felt again. Going back to the Patriots Cowboys game, yeah. Every Cowboys better that whole game. Was, I'm on the right side because this is a, a one-sided blowout, or should be. But then it didn't work out that way, and, and this these games obviously did. We'll, we'll get to the Chargers more, but with this yeah. game, certainly the tone that was set from the jump didn't change uh, at all. Grant, before we let you go, man, any other takeaways from this week? Um, you know, from from games you saw, lines you were surprised by, results you were surprised by, and maybe a, a takeaway from you on what's happening going forward. I was excited that the Tottenham Jaguars got a win. That was cool. The Tottenham <laughs> Jaguars did get a yes. win. Yes. I was on that side. How, it's, it's really hard for me to cheer for this team now with Urban, but whatever. I still I had a good feeling about it. Isn't it insane they, they went through. five games without making a field goal? That doesn't even make any sense. And then they've got this kid off the street with Matthew Wright, <laughs> and he, he makes a 15-yard draw mm -hmm. on that one field goal. That was funny. I'm listening to the, the broadcast, and Kevin Harlan right off the foot, nope. Oh? <laughs> oh? And then it bends in. And then he drills the 53-yarder. Trevor Lawrence continues to play good football, 319 yards, touchdown. And, and the biggest thing, after a streak of turning the ball over at least twice every game to open his career, um, he has been much better about protecting the football in recent games. Marvin Jones, a big game in this one. Um, James Robinson continues to make everyone wonder why on earth they took a running back in the first round of this year's draft. But um, that was uh, – that was it was it uh, we kind of talk smack about the games we send to London – but both it's of them have been London entertaining. Air, like man. it's been bad teams and and kind of goofy football. But Jets Falcons two weeks ago, yeah. uh, and then uh, Dolphins Jaguars this weekend was uh, was a good. I one. mean, still when you just said those matchups, it's like were oh, they it's really bad. as interesting? Yeah. As, maybe we're giving a little too much credit there. Uh, Grant, thank you so much, uh, and the public thanks you because you guys had a bad week. That's always good for us. <laughs> we appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a long season. It's a long. Season. It is a long season. We'll see you again soon. Thanks, Grant. Appreciate you, Grant. Uh, we mentioned Chargers. I want to get into that game a little bit because this is a new segment we're going to introduce. We're going to have fun with this. I always say ebbs and flows, but it's true. You win some, you lose some, and you got to hold that L. And you also got to take a victory lap. So we're going to do that. We're all about accountability here yes. and transparency on Bet to Win. Transparency. Uh, the L that, I, that I'm holding very high is the Chargers loss. I don't know if I'm just so high on Justin Herbert or if I just thought this offense was better than it is, but... I definitely thought they were better than, than what they showed against this Ravens team, but it also might be that I'm just not high enough on the Ravens 
and that I thought really all they had was Lamar Jackson, all they had was Hollywood Brown, and that they were they were getting too close in games. I didn't think that they would start like they did and have control of the whole entire game, and the Chargers really didn't have a chance here. I, I'm going to share this one. Usually we try to go with different picks and, yeah. and diversify the show a bit. This was such a big L for me. I have to hold it as well. It's interesting because there were a couple of games, the Chargers and Cardinals versus the Ravens, you know, or Chargers and Cardinals, two teams, really poor run defenses. Yeah. And then you have uh, the Chargers, or not the Chargers, the Ravens and Browns, two teams with great rushing offenses. So you mm -hmm. look at how much, how much do you make of that one matchup? Yeah. And I, I didn't make a ton of it in either one. Now with the Cardinals, I was on the right side of it because they scored a ton of points and you take away the running game. I think the story here is, yes, the running game was allowed to eat for Baltimore, but it's so much easier when, when the Chargers offense is on the sideline. Damn near all game. Mm -hmm. Chargers 3 of 12 on third down. We've seen their success on fourth down all season long. Their offense hadn't failed on a fourth down conversion try. They were 8 for 8 going into this game. They were just 1 of 4 in this one. So you saw some of that expected regression back to the mean. Um I think this is also an interesting one. It's like, how much do you decide to overreact or underreact to yeah. this? I think it's fair to say a West Coast team going east, early window. I think we've seen enough from the Chargers to, to have faith that they are a good team as opposed to the Broncos, who I believe have been exposed. Yeah. Yeah. This is a game which is a bad day from Jump Street for the Chargers. It was. And I, I don't mean, think it necessarily means Justin Herbert's still in his second year. While I think he's already a superstar. That's going to happen for young quarterbacks. Tip your cap to the Ravens defense, who played tremendous football in this game. I was shocked that they continued to target Mar Marlon Humphrey as much as they did, mm, yeah. given he is their one real true standout cover guy on that defense. But I, still, point of this segment, no excuses. Yeah. I'm holding this L. I had a bunch of teasers that were all lined up. Beauty, check, check, <laughs> check, 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 check. And the Chargers, again, this one was bad. From the get-go, you're down 17 nothing against a team that has such a good offense and is so good at controlling the football yes. with its ground game. Also, turning back the clock, Latavius Murray, Devontae Freeman, and Le'Veon Bell scored a I, touchdown? I, yeah, I was going to say that, yeah. I know. What? Yeah. And uh, I mean, yeah. yeah. Huge L, huge L for me. Huge L. Um, with the Chargers getting smoked, and my teasers are, are crying uh, as a result. Right. Like, it was like, last week was really fun because we had – Matt Lindemann, and he was like, it was a bad week for the book. And I was like, damn right it was, because it was a great day <laughs> for this guy. Yeah. And I didn't even get to really celebrate in the wins because I know. all my teasers lost because of this one. Well, that's why teasers are high risk, but high reward. Um, I, I will say moving forward, it's not that I have less faith in the Chargers, but I mean, I think I have more faith in the Ravens and the Ravens defense. They just held the Chargers to 181. 182 passing yards, and that's kind of what we're hanging the hat it's on just for so, Herbert and the offense. None of, the, none of this was foreseen. Like, you, you couldn't have seen right. it coming. Earlier in the week on Monday night, Carson Wentz carved up this Ravens defense for right. 400 so, yards. Yeah. Look, if, if Carson Wentz can do it, and Michael Pittman and Mo Ali cox and, and Jonathan Taylor, surely Justin Herbert, Austin Eckler, right. Jared Cook, Keenan Allen, and Mike Williams will be able to do the same. Ugh. Not so much. Yep. Big L for us. Uh, this one is also, it's like it's such a, a loss. It's a brutal it's, loss. It's kind of easier to swallow as opposed to if you were on yeah. the Patriots yeah. and lose that way with the, you know, the bad beat. These ones where you're like, I wasn't on the right side. You take it, move on, um, as opposed to feeling like you got robbed. Yeah, not predictive. Those results definitely not. Uh, the Bengals lines was one that I did predict. This take is your victory be, This is going to be my victory lap. Uh, I laid the points with the Bengals. I was pretty shocked that they were only laying three and a half here. Didn't really have to sweat a second of this game. I knew the Lions weren't a good team. They showed that. Uh, scoreless until the fourth quarter. So, again, didn't sweat this one. I don't want to overhype the Bengals, but with only two losses against the Packers, one that they could have won, um, and another against the Bears, both very close games, they're a good team until they prove me otherwise. The Lions are just not a good team. The Bengals <laughs> are fun. The Bengals are fun. And that offense is fun. Joe yeah. Mixon had a huge game yesterday. Joe Burrow has had multiple touchdown passes in all six games this season. They've been really impressive. Jamar Chase continues to be an absolute mm. baller. Uh, I'm going to take my victory lap with the Seahawks covering five. I said on Thursday that 
uh, the Steelers aren't a good enough team to get five points against anybody. And I think this game, while it didn't show in the in the first half, the Seahawks dominated the second half and had every opportunity to win that game. Alex Collins tore up the Steelers' run defense in the second half. Geno Smith was efficient and finally got into a bit of a rhythm yeah. in that second half. This game was tied 17-17. The Seahawks were in position to go score a touchdown before that third down sack where they kicked the field goal and made it 17-17. And then you look at Jamal Adams' pass that was thrown right to him, and the dude couldn't even get a hand on it, <laughs> smoked him square in the face. Yeah. They, the Steelers go down, kick a field goal, take a lead. Um, and then uh, you talk about in overtime, uh, the Seahawks had two possessions. T.J. Watt ruined both of those with sacks, one being a strip sack that led to you know, that the Steelers didn't even need to make a drive. They took one knee, kicked the field goal, um, and, and won. But uh, I feel real good about this one, given that Geno Smith was in there instead of Russell Wilson, given that the Seahawks were going on the road uh, across the country and playing in prime time in a, in a ruckus atmosphere at Heinz Field. This, again, less about the Seahawks and more about the Steelers, who I don't think anyone watched that game and thought, outside of Casey Hayward and T.J. Watt, that this team is scary at all. Yeah. Najee Harris had a nice game. Deontay Johnson, obviously, a nice piece. But, but Ben still remains cooked. Oh, um, and it really bad. was, I mean, it was T.J. Watt who just absolutely dominated this game from, from start to finish. Yeah, I mean, good for Geno Smith. Big, yeah. Big Ben, come on, man. That, <laughs> this is just, he, is there any hope? Like, is he done? Is his... Is Big Ben done? I think he's done. I think he was done last year. The guy can't move. He's not as accurate as he used to be. His deep ball is a duck now. Mm. I, I just this whole this whole team I think is limited. But certainly when you're at limited at the quarterback position, I don't think this this team is going anywhere. They're they're lucky to be at three and three. They beat some bad teams. I don't think this team is going anywhere. I'm fine mm. saying that they're done. Yeah. They might they might scratch and claw their way to five hundred, but. They're not going to be a factor. I concur, my friend. All right. I like that segment. It's fun. Accountability. We'll always, we'll always start Accountability with a loss is key. and then end with the victory lap. Yeah. You want to end on a good note. Accountability is key. <laughs> we talked uh, NBA starting up at the beginning of the show. We're going to dive into kind of futures and what we expect from the season on Thursday. But I want to mention this promo we have going on. Joe and I have tweeted it out. If you follow WinBet at WinBet on Twitter, you've seen this as well. It's a fun one, which it's kind of interesting how they set these up, and I'm curious to get your take. There's a there's a ton of them, so if you guys want to find the full breakdown, either go to winbet.com, download the app, of course. Uh, basically, we're celebrating the 75th season. The games kick off tomorrow. Bucks host Nets, Lakers host Warriors. But with this promo, it's basically all-time legends versus current players, star props. And if you're just listening and you're not watching, um, we have the graphic up behind us, but we got MJ versus KD in career points per game. We've got Kobe versus LeBron points per game. We got Larry Bird three point field goals against Steph Curry. We've got some fun combos. This is a cool promo that I wouldn't have thought of. It's cool that the traders put this together. Yeah, this is a fun one. And there's a number of, like, they're very unique. And I, I, yeah. I talked to um, Alan about it, um, the head of our book, and just about how they were in the lab, just kind of grind on figuring out which would be fun um, and how to create the lines for them. But it's all, I mean, it's all organized around kind of the, the, the conversation we all love to have of comparing generations of would mm -hmm. this team beat that team? Was this player better than the ex-Hall of Famer of yesteryear? Um, and there are some, some really fun ones. I have a, a, a couple of favorites um, where anytime there's, there's ones that are that season long. So whether it's averages versus another player's average from a year ago or from years ago, or, there's, or ones that can be well, one-offs. Mm -hmm. So you have Steph Curry, you know, can he beat Larry Bird's top three-point field goal performance uh, in a game? Larry Bird had seven. They, they're given a spread into it, so with minus four and a half, can Curry get 12 in any game this year? If he does it in any game this year, you win. Uh, Luka Doncic, can he beat Dirk's single-game scoring record? 53 uh, it was for Dirk. So at any night, you can, you can mm -hmm. show up. You watch Luka, who's one of the most fun and entertaining players in the NBA, you know he's going to go off on a regular basis, and you could say maybe this is the night for me. So all 82 games, yeah. um, you're going to have a shot at that. Do you have a favorite that, that you're going to you're gonna check out? I do, yeah. And, and you mentioned this is kind of 
surrounding that conversation, I feel like it's always MJ or LeBron. So for this promo, it's MJ versus KD. But I do like this one, career points per game. Uh, MJ is the favorite, minus 300. And when I went through, it seemed like... That's going against Durant's, what he's going to score this year. Career points per game, yeah, yeah. So average. Um, So So MJ's career versus Durant's 2021, 2022 season, yep. Yeah, so that's why you you kind of have to like read into that, make sure you have you have the the facts straight. But this one's fun. I like this one. Uh, you get Durant at plus two fifty, so I think it's pretty good value. He averaged twenty seven last season. That was after a year away from the game, so he's had that full season full season this past year. Um, he's fresh off of an Olympic Olympics victory where he proved he's quite literally the best, if not the Put best. Put the country on his back. Top three uh, players in the world because it was the Olympics. I think he's overdue for another MVP award. Um, the only one ever he had was in 2014. And we're going to talk MVP on Thursday. But I like this. I think there's great value with Durant at plus 250. Uh, just to have a few more points. Maybe. Yeah. Just, <laughs> just yes, a few just more. Few, but go Sonic. In 27. Sonic's legend, Kevin Durant. Yes, rookie sir. of the year. What do you like? Oklahoma City. Do you have one that you're super have hot mentioned? on? You, you have I mentioned yet that I hate Oklahoma City? <laughs> I they think s- once or that twice. That they stole Kevin Durant and Russell Westbrook away from us. There's like that picture of it was right after Russell Westbrook got drafted by the Sonics and this is the year they ended up moving. Yeah. So he never played a game in Seattle. So there's a picture of him and Durant in mm. Sonics hats. And it's like, what could have been? <laughs> what could have I'm been? so thankful they never won a title in Oklahoma City. <laughs> it's beautiful. Joe, um it's good you don't hold grudges. Yeah, I'm over it though. I'm actually yeah, I'm not even gonna have to pretend that I'm over it, because I never will be over it. I can't wait till the Sonics come back. And then Oklahoma City comes to town for the first time. That's a game I'll make sure I'm at. Mm-hmm. That's going to be fun. Okay. Um, whenever that happens. Whenever, yeah. I'm going to go with uh, Zion Williamson Ooh. to have more points per game and rebounds per game combined than Charles Barkley in Charles Barkley's third season. So in, 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 uh, in Chuck's third year, put up 37.6 points plus rebounds per game. Zion's at plus 150 to top that. He was at 34.2 last season. He's still just 21. I think the rebounding numbers, he was at 7.2 last year, should continue to go up. Yeah. And, and the thing I'm looking at here, there's, it's twofold. He played 33 minutes a game last year. If he can get up over 34, I think he's got a great chance to top this. Um, as an ascending player, he's on the, one of the worst teams in the league. They lost Lonzo Ball, lost Eric Bledsoe, a couple of ball-dominant guards. And so it's the Brandon Ingram and Zion show. Yeah. So – this guy should be very capable of getting to this number. You get it at plus money. Who doesn't want to watch Zion on a nightly basis? Pelicans aren't going to be a fun team. Zion will be fun on a nightly <laughs> basis. Um, and so I like this, this play against Chuck. Let's just hope he stays healthy. Yep. Big boy jumping around there. Makes me nervous. Yeah, so that's a really fun promo. Make sure you guys what check it out. What if he just like if- put up like 30, 30 and 10 in night one, then gets hurt? And then that's his. Then it would technically. Then it counts. Yeah, you might cash. I'm just kidding. I would not. I would <laughs> never root for that. Never, um, never. Uh, if you guys like something, if you're listening or watching, make sure you tweet at us. Let us know because we'd love to share uh, your take on this promo. These will be open and one. tell the, the tip tomorrow night between Bucks and Nets. Yes. Winning pick. And then we're out of here. We got Bills Titans tonight. Bills are laying six. This was part of a parlay I had. So I had Packers. I had Bengals. I had Bills. Packers, Bengals covered with flying colors. I had a lot of different props I wanted to go here. I, I was looking at Bills over 30 and a half points. I wanted to go Allen over passing. 292 is pretty high. We're expecting a high scoring game here. I decided I'm just going to go with my gut here. I'm going to lay the six with the Bills. I've made my point about Josh Allen. I made my point about him with the MVP conversation last week. Uh, the Bills can get their points in the air. They can do it on the ground. They're leading the NFL in scoring offense. They haven't scored less than 35 points in the past four games, which is why I was looking at that total The Titans are 24th in scoring defense. The Bills defense giving up the least total yards, least total points. We know, everyone keeps saying, but Derrick Henry, did you see that stiff arm last game? We know he's the Titans' biggest offensive weapon. But the Bills have the third best defense against the run in terms of rushing yards allowed. The Bills are coming off a win against the Chiefs, two blowouts before that. The Titans just lost to the Jets two games ago. I'm confident that the Bills win by even more than a touchdown here. I like that pick. I'll tell that as well. Uh, I think both of us in our, our parlay parte last week, mm. this <clears throat> this was the final leg. I had the Cowboys and the Bengals as well. So this will be one that, that wraps it up for both of us. It's just 
don't overthink it. Right. Take the better football team. And, and the Bills, as we've seen this last month, uh, are, are potentially the best team in football. Mm-hmm. Uh, and certainly right now the best in the AFC. Um, I'm going to go with hoops because why not? Let's get in the spirit. A oh, couple of great games on Tuesday. Uh, you have the Bucks getting all their rings, hosting the Nets, what I think everyone expects to be a preview of the Eastern Conference Finals. Yeah. And then the nightcap is the Lakers, the new look Lakers hosting uh, the Warriors. The Warriors still without Klay Thompson. Obviously, the Lakers have the trio, and, and this is the, the debut of Russell Westbrook, LeBron James, and Anthony Davis, but they've added a ton of offense, period. I think Carmelo Anthony is a guy who will play 12 to 15 minutes a game, and if he's, you know, he can still get you 8 to 10 points in a hurry. Uh, Kendrick Nunn and Wayne Ellington, I think, uh, are, are both guys who can get you points off the bench. Same with Malik Monk. This is a very deep team. I think eventually there's going to be a rough patch with the big three, and they're not being uh, enough basketball to go around, given how ball dominant all three of those guys are. Um, but I think this is they want to make this work. Russell Westbrook, and I'm not really a big Russell Westbrook fan, mm. but this is a guy who hasn't been able to get his title yet. So he, I, I do think he's going to be able to put his ego aside and say, whatever it takes to get that ring, now that his career is, is sort of in the twilight years, I think he's going to do. The honeymoon period will be there. And I think they come out. I'm taking, I'm taking the juice here. Lakers money line over the, uh, the Warriors minus 165. Um, and I'm excited to watch some hoops. I'll be rocking my Sonics gear while I, while I, while I do it. I'm actually headed to Memphis today because uh, we got a oh, partnership yeah. with the Grizzlies. We'll be at the Grizzlies home opener um, against the Cavs. Check out my boy Ja. Be like, what's up, Ja? <laughs> He's going to be like, oh, Joe like, fan. what up, man? <laughs> oh, I like that's your, my guy. I like your Sonics hat. <laughs> Go Supes. I'm jealous that you're going to have fun. It's going to be Memphis cool. It should be, it's gonna cool. be a good time. Yeah. Excited to hear about it on Thursday, which is where we'll break down some more NBA. Of course, we'll talk football and uh, some baseball as well. So thanks for watching, guys. That's episode 12 in the books. We'll see you Thursday.